The thing that I'm most excited about now probably is baseball. I mean, imagine if you were calling the pitches. We've got a really good working model about how baseball can be completely just revamped, just modernized, reinvented for the digital age. So what we did was, because I was really a bit of a skeptic when we had the opportunity to, to do NASCAR. I was like, well, hey, before I go, what's like the one thing that you would tell me? Like, what's the what's the piece of piece of advice that's gonna really put him on the spot. And he just said it confidently and then walked off into the sunset. And he said, Diaz, what do you think is the deepest essence of the art of selling? Super capable, high-performing salespeople are those. It's amazing to, to have you back on the podcast. And we had a wonderful discussion last time. Yeah. And this time around, uh, you are in Prague uh, yes. coming to visit me. What an honor. Uh, it's been, uh, I think, a little over a year since we chatted last time. That's right. right. I'm excited to be back. Uh, like, honestly, I, my question is, how many repeat guests have you had? A few. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. You, I'm, you I'm part of an exclusive club, though. Very exclusive. That's what I'm excited I about. <laughs> two, like you are either second or third. Incredible. All right. Yeah. Exactly. And I think it it speaks for itself, yeah. right? I have uh, tremendously enjoyed our conversation last time. Yeah. And I have no doubts that it's going to get even better today. Um, yeah. Um, but let's get into it. I'm very excited. We, we are very neatly set up uh, after all the experience that. Uh, we have had a chance to do together earlier today and, and yesterday. I so. mean, best day ever? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, today has been incredible. We did the uh, we did the cold plunge. Thank you for introducing me to this. We went we went back and forth and did the the plunge and the sauna. And I like I told you as we were going into it. I was like, I'm either going to absolutely love this or it's going to be a nightmare. There's going to be no middle ground. There's no like suffering through it. And it was like like everything. I just was like, all right. Once I'm in, I'm all in. And so I've been thinking about it all day. I do your prediction, like you feel like a million bucks all day. I, I feel great. So I awesome. have been very impressed with your performance in the river. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Like, you know, I, I do this two, three times a week. Yeah. And it's not getting any easier. <laughs> it's not getting any easier at all. And you, for the very first time, like three minutes, no problem. And when we went again, you were like, oh, I, I'll stay longer yeah, than you. I, I got like, this. Okay, okay, <laughs> I understand. Okay. But I think it uh, speaks a lot about your mindset, right? Oh, thank you. Um, is there something that uh, makes you excited about uh, overcoming challenges? And like, how, how do you cope with all of that? Because I feel like, for me, it's very relatable to uh, be building a business, uh, sure. running startup, yeah. uh, uh, overcoming these mental challenges. Yeah. What, what, what does that mean for you? Uh, well, so first of all, thank you. You're very kind that I like performed well. Like, what, like I watched you as as I as I watch you descend gracefully. Your face doesn't move. You're just like I, like I was saying in, in real time. You're just calm as a Hindu cow. You're just like zen out. <laughs> and I get in there and I'm like, uh, 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 and it was it was about the breath. I was like, I think that's the key. If you if you if people are looking to do cold plunges, it's, it's all in the breath. Um, so thank you for that coaching. Uh, you were you were a good coach. Well, thank you for describing me as a Hindu cow. It was like. But you were so chill. You were like so zen in the moment. You were like present. I think you even closed your eyes at one moment. And I am paddling manically. I'm like, don't drown, don't drown. And I tried to, the, the strategy to continue to like swim out and then come back wasn't helping. I thought if I moved around, it would increase my body heat, but ended up being better just staying still. Yeah, I think it's the opposite. The more you move, yeah. the worse it gets. Which is so totally counterintuitive. If you, master, <laughs> if you master swimming in cold water, then you've really made it. I'm, I'm very excited about it. So, um, yeah, cold plunge this week. Um, I mean, to answer your question, I, um, I, uh, around challenges, I think that's like, I think most founders have that mind. You have to have that as a founder, right? Like this, 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 this desire to see something um, and, and take it on full force and not let anything get in your way. And like, so I sort of, we were talking about this earlier. I don't, I don't live, it's an either or dichotomy with, with everything I do. I either do it or I do it all in, or I don't do it. And so that's why I'm very selective about the things that I take on. And I think that translates to, to business and personal life as well. It's like I'm very selective with, you know, who gets my time, like who I spend time with. It's uh, very selective about like projects we take on uh, in, in the business and whatnot. And so it's about selecting the right things and knowing and being self-aware and knowing that if you're going to go, you're going to go hard at it or you're not like, but, and so that's what, that's why I love this experience. Cause I don't think innately it was anything that I was going to go just be like, Hey, that looks cool. I'm going to go try that. But again, thank you for introducing it to me. And, and now like I'm, I'm all in. Has it always been easy for you to say no to things? 
That's a great question. You know, no. Uh, <laughs> speaking of no, uh, it hasn't. I think early in my career, well, I'll tell you where, when when that shifted. I think early in my career, I was uh, I had two things that it took me a long time to understand that people aren't fragile. I always like would tiptoed around. I was very direct, but I would make sure because I think candor generates speed, right? Like I say what I mean, I mean what I say. I'll, I'll always been sure, but I always related to people innately as like if I didn't massage the message in the right way that they would just break. And people are, they're very resilient, and especially if you surround yourself with the right people. And then the second thing that really shifted for me in, in my career is, is that saying no, is that, so, and it came to me from a guy named David Edmondson. So do you know, do you know the name? Do you know Dave? You heard of? I don't. So Dave's an incredible guy. So he is the former CEO of Radio Shack. He was, uh, okay. Yeah. That tells me something. Yeah, yeah. Grew, grew wire. He, he, he's the one that brought Wireshack into the wireless retail age where they started selling phones and like transformed that business. Um, and we had had a, had a startup earlier in my career um, and the exit was looming and Dave was the one acquiring it. He pulled some money together from some venture capitalists and, and, and bought the business. Um, and so shortly afterward, after the acquisition, stayed on for a little bit to obviously ensure there was a good transition, but like I was ready for some new challenges. And uh, you, you, I'm the kind of guy that likes to build the house, but I don't want to live in it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and so I had built it. hundred percent. Yeah, I know. I, 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 cool. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so I was like ready to move on. But the one thing, man, that I was really bummed out about was that I was not going to, I admired him. The guy's like a, you ever see those guys that he's like, just storyteller. I don't think he graduated high school. I definitely didn't go to college, but he's the, he was a, he was a pastor and he was like larger than life and he'd sketch shit out on a napkin and he'd be like, see right there. And like he had ability to get everybody on board with this vision. And so I was like, look, I mean, you're, you're that way too. You, 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 you want to look for those positive examples and things you can emulate, especially if you think you can learn for something, especially early in the career. Oh, yeah. Anyway. So I had said I was moving on and um, the the exit interview was like a passing in the hallway, right? I was like, all right, well, you know, good luck. He was, um, and so I was like, well, hey, before I go, what's like the one thing that you would tell me? Like, what's the what's the piece of piece of advice that's gonna really put him on the spot? That's gonna help me in my career the most. And he just said it confidently, and then walked off into the sunset. He said, he said, Diaz, strategy is all about what you say no to. And then he like dropped the mic and walked off, and and uh, and I think that's been a real guiding principle. I mean, for me. Uh, it just really resonated because to your point, I was, a, uh, I was, I can do anything, right? Like it's a completely unfounded sense of self-confidence. Like I have no business believing I can do anything or everything or all these things, but I would, I would try everything. And again, so as, as you grow and as you learn, it's the, it's get selective about what you, you know, what, what you want to take on. Cause it makes all the difference in the world. I think both in a, in your personal life and in your business. Dude, this is so right. And like, I often struggle personally with saying no to things. Yeah. And like, yeah, and very clear. Like, I have a personal obsession that every single message that I receive yeah. uh, deserves an answer. Across all platforms. So, text, email, Slack, I, I will, I Telegram. Will, I will explain further, but uh, in general, yes. It's commitment. It, no, there's no way. There's no way, right? So, uh, as I progress in my career, right, I'm trying to build the boundaries of like where this threshold is. And of course, like if I receive a newsletter, obviously, yeah, I'm not yeah, gonna like, thank you for the that. newsletter. Have a great day. Uh, I think like all of the LinkedIn messages yeah. uh, from people that I don't know. Yes. Uh, fall into that category, right? I don't respond, right? Yeah. Un unless yeah. unless it's something like uh, interesting and exciting, I don't. Yeah. Um, if it's like a, a cold email, yeah, I I don't respond. No, because you're getting dozens, if not hundreds, a week. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, the, just the sheer volume of yeah. those things yeah. you can't commit to. But uh, outside of that, right? We have eliminated the. Um, uh, the easy things, but yeah. outside of that, there is still like a lot of things that are coming from all sides. And then it's, it's people asking you to grab a coffee with them, sure. lunch, dinner, yep. uh, speak at an event, uh, and, and all of those, uh, kind of things. And I have to, I have to say that uh, I, I had to, and I still have to, uh, keep on, um, learning how to say no to things. 
Sure. Because I think that I'm generally wired as a yes man. Yeah, uh, I, I can see that though. That there's a there, there. I think there's some virtue, right? There's a can-do attitude. I think you can get it all done. But what my takeaway from this is that if you don't learn how to say no to things, then you don't have your life right under control. Right, right? It's true. The life uh, has the control of you. Yeah, and you pretty much just go with the flow. And that's something that, uh, you know, I don't want yeah. this to be happening. And I have realized uh, that uh, probably five years ago, uh, that's when I started uh, seeing the patterns that I have hard time saying no to things. And I have to become, uh, yeah, a bit more persistent. I admire, though, well, one of the things I admire in people, and, and just especially you being able to, to, to notice that, is self-awareness. I think being self-aware is like a superhero power, right? And as you level that up, then your whole life tends to tends to be a little bit easier. I um I, I also think that you're the kind of guy that has like limitless possibilities. Like again, you could do anything because of how you're wired, but also like where you are from a professional standpoint. And so it's like there's never that that's all just always gonna come. It's not like you're like some people have that a lot easier, right? They've got a couple different options and they choose between A or B and you've got the whole alphabet. Yeah. Uh, I think that you are hitting uh, the nail on the head because in the end, if I think about what's my greatest strength, mm -hmm. well, my greatest strength is that I'm really, really good in a lot of things. Yeah, and, and for that, sure. And that's, for a, sure. that's a problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> because I'm not, the, I'm not the very best in one, things in part, uh, one thing in particular, yeah, I mean, but yeah. uh, there is uh, quite a plethora of things that, uh, that I can do fairly well. Sure. And then like you have this paralysis of choice. Okay, yeah. what do I yeah. do, right? Where do I invest my time? So um, I think if you want to really achieve something, uh, it's important. And that's where it really resonated with me when you said that like, the like key strategy is to be able to say no to things. Blew my mind. I was like, he just, he was very confident in that. He just had it right in the hip. Sometimes people say these like super simple words. Yeah. But they mean a lot. Yeah. It was a, it was a home run for me. It, like authentically changed my life. Well, so let me ask you this too. So two questions from what you said. One, because I'm fascinated by this, because I the art of cold selling is, is fascinating. I mean, the, these people that are banging out like these cold emails, is there anything that has ever hooked you? Like, have you ever looked at something and been like, I can't not respond to that? 100%. No. Yeah. Oh, you've, you've, 100%. You've been, what, what was it? Yeah. And like, I'm very genuine in that, that like, yes, 99% out of those uh, like call emails, they go like straight up delete. And then all of them ask for a phone call. They don't just like want to like send you something. They're like, can we get on the phone? Here's my Calendly. I, I think that... Uh, like there is a simple formula that I have identified that helps to convert me. Okay. Right. So, uh, if uh, you know someone is listening and drafting a cold outreach campaign targeted to uh, you know uh, companies like STRV or people like myself, right? What works for me is if I see a lot of social proof uh, okay. of what the person has done. Yeah. Sure. And like social proof is not enough. Social proof puts you on the map, right? Sure. Okay, it, yeah. it, it mentions like yeah. I am relevant. Yeah. But then if you start bringing in my closest circle of people and you mentioned I have worked with this guy, sure. that guy, yep. and I have, I helped him with this and that. Yep. That gets my attention sure. because like if it's people that I have uh, worked with in the past or people that I know very well, yeah. then I can extremely easily cross-reference whether that person is bullshitting me yes, or definitely. there is something on that, right? Definitely. So um, I feel like if you are looking on, on a, uh, for a partner in a particular field, um, you always look for a point of reference, right? Yeah. Yeah. You ask your... Um, like uh, network for recommendations, etc. Sure. Mm -hmm. So what helps to convert me when someone is reaching out is like if there is that point of reference sure. established already, yeah, yeah, yeah. because then I immediately can tap into oh what have you done together, yeah. and then I can go and check uh, sure. with with that contact that I have and like you know there is there is uh, uh, like people that offer thousands of different things, but in the end like. Um, 
I feel like you just need to stand out of the crowd. And um, I probably respond to less than 1% oh, yeah, I'm of awesome. those mes- yeah, messages. Sure. But sometimes they really they really hit different. They have the punchline that you are like, okay, okay. That, sound, that sounds interesting. I might just take the call. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, it's um, a shame to admit this, but I've got a weird tick when people send me cold emails and it's, it's with inaccurate information. Like I was just browsing the internet and I saw the ads that you were running when I know we're not running any ads. I feel the need to be like, oh yeah, which one? <laughs> like, and then I'm all of a sudden I'm engaged with them and it gets me almost every time. And now I'm sure my inbox is going to be flooded with like, uh, with, with incorrect information emails. But it gets me every time. Yeah, that's uh, that happens extremely often. I also like I, I end up taking. I, I said one percent. I actually think that's probably maybe a little low. I'm probably in the five percent range, just because I I've got a real empathy for people who have to just bang out cold emails all day, right? When that is your your day to day, and for what it's worth, so I grew up. I grew up, and one of my first jobs as I was growing up was selling vacuums door to door. Uh, I, you, you mentioned that to me at one point, yeah. You know, true story. We'll see this guy. The, I don't know if I told the story in the last podcast, but I won't. I won't reiterate it. But a guy came in and sold my parents, like cold off the street, rang the doorbell, and I think my parents are pretty savvy people. You know, I mean, I'm sure you can get one over on them. But this guy came into the house, uh, got not only got in. The, my mom's bringing him like a soda and he's doing this vacuum demo and it's not like any vacuum. It's like a Kirby G4. It was like $1,500. Yeah. And it was like, it's like a big commitment. My folks didn't have the resources financially to buy that. And they, they weren't looking for a vacuum, but they bought it. And the guy gave him like a hundred dollar discount to, to make a list of like 10 of your best friends. And so like my parents wrote out names and numbers and I was just, well, I was transfixed. I just didn't say anything to this guy. And then he leaves and I chased him out of the, the, the chased him out of the door. And I was like, could you, can I just follow you? Can I do this? Like, I want to learn that. Not, if for not only reason to, to, for me to be able to manage my own parents better, but like also like there's something to that Jedi mind trick. So I spent a year kind of knocking on doors and selling vacuums. And so I'm like, I understand the plight of the people that are coming in cold and the number of like just sales masterclass and, 101. Yeah, for sure. What do you what do you think is the deepest essence of the art of selling? After you had a chance to follow this gentleman for about a year, like what was what was his move? Um, you know, it's a great question. I think he had a deep tool tool bag, right? Like I think the guy could pull out a million different tools, and I think what what he did very well, and then we're also carried. Um, I'm not currently very Mormon, but I grew up very Mormon. I did the whole Mormon mission thing. And so that was also selling God door to door. And if you can sell God, you can sell anything. And I think, I think like actual super capable, high performing salespeople are those who can build an authentic relationship and can do it quickly. Right. This ability to like, because everybody spots a phony like bullshit, right? Like I think, especially now, as we've all been sold over and over again, like that, you know, you know, that fa- that insincere, I'm here for the sale, but if you build relationships on and, and build things in common, like this whole like, oh, you went to Kansas. My brother lives in Kansas. If there's this ability to like, and listen and take a genuine interest in people, I think that is a, it unlocks a lot because if you've got like, again, if they, they know you're likable and relatable and then they, they, there's that level of trust. Right. And then they'll, and then, you know, those types of relationships serve you for not just the initial sale, but you know, in other types of sales, they end up being you know, your LTV on that customer ends up being through the roof. So building the genuine connection. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough to, and it's tough to teach too, right? Like that's one of those things that I think comes with a lot of reps, but you get a, a you know, a room full of salespeople and it's tough to just say, okay, like, no, but be real, you know? What do you think that are some of the things in business and entrepreneurship that are not teachable? Like what are the things that you you feel that you need oh. to born with? Yeah, yeah, you have versus to. what what are the things that you can pick up, dude? You know what I think it is? I genuinely think it's like grit. It's like it's it's tenacity because there are people that will hustle. There's whip smart people, but it's you're gonna get knocked down over and over and over again. And it's the guys that can continue to get get up and gals and p- people that can get up over and over again that I don't, that feels innate to me. I could be wrong. And if there's a magic, you know, magic wand out there that could teach that stuff. And, you know, I think you, that evolves and continues to deepen. But to me, it seems binary. Like you either have that or you don't. And if you don't, that doesn't, not everybody has to be an entrepreneur, right? Like it is not for the faint of heart. It's not everybody. My brother 
super smart guy, but has, has been in the, the, the big consulting firms because that's just not his jam. So I think, uh, I don't know, yeah, I think grit and tenacity are those things. What, what do you think? Well, I think that grit and tenacity, most definitely. Yeah. And I think like it's it's kind of essential that uh, you need to have the persistence and perseverance. And we talk we talked about it earlier that uh, if you if you don't have that, then like you are probably not gonna stick around for long enough to make any meaningful progress. Right. And I think what I would add to that is, and we also chatted about that earlier is positivity yeah, right yeah, if you sure. if you are like how do you learn to be positive i feel like it's extremely hard maybe there is a way to um like get coached uh, to think more yeah. positively but it's certainly not something that you change overnight I, I don't think it's overnight, but I'm really curious. I, you also strike me. I know I was talking about my pos- positivity, but like, what? How, how did you learn? Was it? Do you feel that you were just kind of born with that, or was that something that you had a mentor who you saw a possibility in? I think I have always been that way, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And as you know, the the saying goes that uh, in in the end we play big games. We are adults, but we all carry our childhood traumas uh, uh, throughout our lives and they influence, you know, um, I did not get that lollipop uh, when I was a kid or that toy that I really wanted uh, or I got beaten by, you know, uh, another kid. uh, And then it influences how I behave uh, 30 years later, for example. It's it's still happening, but in my case, uh, as you asked about the positivity, yeah. it has always been been part of me, and uh, there was not a moment uh, in my life where I would uh, n- not that I would never feel negative. Of course, sure. like as as everyone, yeah, sometimes I'm I'm a little down. Yeah. But when I look at the portion of time when I'm down versus you know the portion of time where uh, when I'm hyped up, yeah. um, it's it's certainly more towards uh, being on the high. I think uh, I think that's so interesting too because I think um, a lot of times people very naively conflate positivity with being like a sucker, right? That like that you just believe in everything and that like that this. Uh, my mother, so I, I learned from my mother. My mother's unmitigated positivity all the time. Again, eyes wide open. She's a shark. She's incredibly smart, but like chooses to see the good in situations and people. And, you know, she's like my my hero. So uh, I, like, I, I saw that that was modeled for me very early and has, has kind of carried through for, for years. There's always a little bit of good in every situation, right? Yeah. Every problem could be uh, an opportunity with... Uh, looking at it through a different lens. Yes. And, you know, the severity of the problems uh, change how, how finely you have to look at through that lens. But yeah, I totally agree. I absolutely. So I think that like, as you go through the journey of uh, building up a business or journey of life, I think that uh, in the end, they are fairly similar. Life is not easy by any means either. Right. It's just like, do you want to put a little bit more on your plate than be an entrepreneur? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that was that something you grew up and always had that bug? Like, did you know early on that you wanted to be the guy building something? Or how did you and you probably shared your journey on this podcast before, but I, I would love to hear like what what when was that was that switch? I did I did share it uh, uh quite uh, quite a couple of times, but still I wanna I want I wanna tell you that uh, uh, again, it has not always been like that. Sure, I def- I, I have it uh, in my family. Both of my parents were entrepreneurs, running their own uh, mm-hmm. small and big businesses sure. uh, at times. But um, so I was I, I was very close to it. I did some freelance web work when I was in high school. Yes. So like very natural for me to be handling client relationships and like grew up with it. Yeah, I yeah. grew up and like yeah. for me to to manage finance and like everything. I got the education, I got the family background and everything. Yeah. Well, when I was done with college, what uh, I um went to do was that I did not think uh, about starting my own business for a second. I 
went to I went and applied for a job. Okay. Um, it was the most uninteresting job yeah. ever. For sure. Well, you know, with my background, um, I, I studied computer science and business. Um, I had a chance to study abroad for one year, so well traveled. Yeah. Uh, nice experience. Um, I think I was on like an ideal path to uh, get like a great job sure. as uh, a software engineer yeah. or um, product manager or s- like just you know entering the the tech uh, the tech field. What I did, I applied for an assistant position in an insurance company. Okay. Like the most boring yeah, job that you could possibly sound that interesting now. apply to. Sure. I have no clue what I I have no clue what I was doing back then. Yeah. Well, you know, there is uh there's a happy ending to that yeah. because uh they rejected me in the very first round. Oh. Um I'm not sure what the reason was yeah, back sure. then, but that one rejection set me on a path that was the to, to be an Let's entrepreneur. Sure. Uh, and yeah, since then, uh, I, I joined my co-founders and yeah. I was on the pursuit to be building something of my own. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah. So prime example of something being a, a problem that ends up being motivation, you found the the silver lining in it and then you've used that as a tool for, for motivation for... Yeah, so, and like, so... Life is not a straight line. And as as <laughs> I just so described, as I just described, like, you know, as much as like when I look at back at my studies, for example, yeah. it looks like a straight line, right? Sure. I went to high school uh, that had a lot of like engineering component to it. I studied computer science and business uh, in college. Yeah. So it's it seems like I was headed to where I am today. Sure. But did I take the exact steps every at every point uh, of the journey? Not at all. I was like, it was like a crazy roller coaster, but uh, it worked out after all. I want to double back to to one of the things you said. What I think was really interesting, which is the fact that you do a number of things really well. As a founder, how what have you put in place to ensure that you are like hiring subject matter experts and then empowering them to do it versus you? stepping in like how how is that how do you how do you delegate yeah when i mentioned that uh, you know i struggle sometimes with saying no yeah i also had to learn how to delegate and how to split the where to focus and where not yeah. to i think like by now i have done pretty much every single role in the company For sure. As throughout the years, yeah. you know, the teams evolve and, uh, yep. I, I've been here the whole time. <laughs> so yeah. there were times, uh, when I had to do sales, I had to do marketing, I had to do, um, recruitment, yeah. all, all of that. Yeah, so yeah. I have hands-on experience of literally doing every single role in the company. I was the one for picking sure. the color of the carpet yeah. for the office that yeah. we are in right now. Yep. Um, you picked out the hot tub that was upstairs. <laughs> not anymore. Oh my God. You talk about the upstairs a lot on this podcast? Not, not that much. Uh, I'll, I'll be, dude, I, just an incredible experience. <laughs> like I kept hearing about it. I got to the office, we hang out. They kept saying, oh, we'll go upstairs later. We'll go upstairs. No idea what I was in for. And it's just this gorgeous bar area, a gym. Was incredible, and apparently there were some legendary stories up there. So we'll, we'll, we'll quite, that. quite, quite some stories for sure. Quite some stories for sure. But back to the delegation yeah. topic and uh, like selecting the right people. So for me, it's like you know I have to look for people that are smarter than me in their respective areas. So true. Yeah. And and if you know you bring somebody who is smarter, has more experience in that particular field, then my approach to it is. Full trust from the day one. It has to be, right? Like, if if I am not able to trust you from the day one, I have not made the right hire. And so, so for me, it's like, you have my full trust. You have all the responsibility. Yeah. Like, I will be watching. For sure. From the sidelines. um, But you operate. 
when I see that people tend to struggle a little bit, yeah, then I come in. I come in to help. Yeah. And then, then usually there is two paths. There is one path that, uh, you know, I come in to help and people are very receptive to it, right? Sure. They are coachable and then they let me show them the way. They learn from it. Yeah. They pick things up. And then I back off again. Sure. There is unfortunately also the other path where you come in to help, yeah. but uh, the other person is extremely protective yeah. and you are not able to, uh, you know, make a meaningful progress. And that, unfortunately, usually results in parting ways. So I just feel like so many founders, I mean, you, you know a bunch of founders, I'm sure, in a lot of your conversations. I feel like that's something that a, a lot of us struggle with, is this, this push and pull to like empower people, hire people smarter than you. Low bar for me. It's very easy to hire somebody smarter than me. But the, the, just to let them, especially because you've got all this institutional knowledge, you've been here from the beginning. So it's not just that particular role, but you know it in context, how it relates to everything else. And so it's just, it's fascinating to hear, uh, you know, how you choose to delegate. We have a whole course uh, at STRV. We have about 30 managers uh, in the company. Okay. So 30 people outside of the or for the 200, yeah. they manage other people, right? So yeah. we specifically specifically focus on them to help them be better leaders. Yeah. And as one part of the Leadership Academy, we help them how to lead and how to use different leadership styles, right? Yeah. You can be very directive or you can be like totally, like you can, you can consult with them or you can let them run on their own. Yeah. And at different times, you should be like, bouncing between different types of the leadership style. Sure. Right? You should like, if you have a new hire, you probably have to be a little directive with them. Of course. Uh, yeah. So they know exactly what you want and what you need. Yeah. And as, as they progress, right, they can take on more uh, of the leading role. You're setting them up to be successful. Yeah. Totally. So, so what, what we really invest our time heavily into is to make sure that we educate the leaders because we have a lot of promotions that happen internally, right? Sure, From yeah. like uh, someone who is uh, an engineer suddenly becomes an engineering manager or engineering director, yeah. right? And then like you need to um, help them pick up uh, the managerial skills so they can effectively work with the team. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is extremely essential that you realize that there is no one right way to lead, yeah. there is different styles and a, gr a great leader needs to be able to adapt uh, the style to fit the situation at hand. I agree with all of that. And I've got two questions for you, Lilo. So number one, have you, in, over the course of your career, found a magic number for your direct reports? Like what's the maximum number of people that you want rolling up to you directly? A lot of thought, yeah. uh, a lot of thought. And then I, I, I want to return that question to you because I feel like uh, this is uh, an extremely interesting topic. And I can say that I have bounced between the number of one to two to 20, okay. um, which I think, you know, yeah. have, there's there are times when that's necessary. I, actually, to be right. I think that we have managed to scale up the company to above 50 people yeah. with uh, no middle management. So so at, at that point when, when we were about 50 people, yeah. there was no hierarchy. It was it was just like co-founders yeah. and the company. Yeah, yeah. Um but we did not really we did not really uh, call that direct reports and sure. I think that like when we established some structure that number fluctuated somewhere between one to two to 20, yeah. right? I feel like if that number is 20, yeah. uh, you barely remember who on <laughs> that, who is on that theme. What was your name again? Uh, <laughs> what do you do here? I think that there is uh, 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 a magical number of seven. Okay. Ma maybe that number is five to 10, yeah. you know? So you have some boundaries on uh, uh, both ends. Yeah. Um, I started reading a book uh, recently. It's called Scaling Up. Okay. Um, and uh, 
very relevant for businesses that want to grow. And it's it's like it it speaks about like you know there's like millions of businesses that are tiny, right? Sure. Only only like very small portion of businesses make it to one million in revenue. So what what they talk about in the book that when you look at how the successful companies are run, yeah, it's the multiplications of uh, the number between seven to 10. Okay. So like, and these are the breaking points. These are the points when you need to add additional layer of yeah. management yeah. Uh, so you can operate effectively. Yeah. So whether it's five or 10, right? It's the low end and high end. It's somewhere there. Yeah. If it's less than five, then you probably do other agenda on your own because you have a lot of free time. Yeah. Uh, if you manage only two, three people, like, you 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 need to be doing you need yeah. to be doing shit hands on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, that that's uh, what I think is uh, you know the the right healthy uh, ratio. Yeah. But upfront meaning you just have that dialogue. You're like, look, I'm juggling so much right now. This is not optimal. Are you saying like that you're transparent with that? Like when you've got too many directors? Yeah. yeah, and like, you have you have it's to be totally transparent. Great. And like, are there times uh, when you just need to power through? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Sure. Unless you have uh, another way that you can like divide and conquer. Yeah. But uh, do you, do you have different uh, experience, or what has been what has it been for you when it comes to like figuring out the right yeah. group of people that you manage? I've also I'm like again like so many founders and, and folks in startup land. It, uh, it's been you know twenty more you know teams of sales teams and 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 a lot smaller. I found that I. Uh, Personally, I think I, I don't know that there is a right answer, and I think um, it's different for everybody. But I like I like that number of five. Five allows me to be hands off, but also you know my I think my job is as as a leader and, and as you know somebody that they roll up to is to remove obstacles for these people. And I like I like having you know making sure that we've got detailed one on ones every week and whatnot. So like that that number for for me is five and can go north of it. And often you know that'll that'll need to happen. But um, but yeah, five five is my number. Yeah, I, to that I would say that the reason why I would aim for a lower number is that I deeply enjoy doing things on my own. I think because especially the lower number two, I I feel that like you know I, I'd be interested. You we've used the the leadership word a couple of times. I would love to hear your definition of that. But like I you know I think leadership in most cases is is instilling a vision, creating and instilling a vision, right? Such that other people act effectively and committedly and excitedly about this thing that we're all going toward. And I feel like five. You go back to that sales, and it's not you know we talked about like the the key to magic bullet to sales is that authentic relationship. And I think with that five, it allows you to go have a very you know, authentic and, and real relationship with each each one of these individuals and create and instill that vision that's personalized to that person, you know? Yeah. Hundred percent. Well, since we chatted since we chatted last time, yeah. how has the world changed for you? That's interesting. Can 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 you remind me where we had we played season two when I talked to you? It was just about to begin. It was just about to begin. Season two is wild. So um, uh, fan control sports entertainment. We did fan control football season two point oh um, was was incredible. We shot in Atlanta. Um, we had a, a purpose built stadium for the for the for the event, uh, and it was it was it was incredible. We we um, are you know, quadrupled our distribution partners. So we were originally on Twitch and we had a really deep relationship with those guys. Um, but then we were on DAZN and Fubo and uh, NBCLX and Peacock. And so we had a lot of eyeballs uh, on the on the season. Um, uh, I don't know, 30 million people tuned in. It was, a, it was an incredible season. So by all accounts, and again, we just, we grew the audience and, and, and the fan base by, you know, every conceivable metric. So, um, and after, you know, it, after that, then we've we've taken a, a look at you ask how the world changes. Is I think you know as we continue to evolve, the we've looked to add like our our, our goal has changed a little bit from having just one or two giant owned and operated leagues to to having you know these these always have there something always have there to be something to do as a fan. There should always be something fan controlled, right? Anytime you pick up the app, you should be able to participate in in something. And so we've we've spent this past year kind of obviously retooling football. We're coming back uh, spring of next year, 
Um, and then we're doing the partnership events. We just did our first NASCAR race, which was wild. Fans controlling a NASCAR. Uh, Looked um, epic, yeah. It was, uh, it, was, it was, I think it was an awesome experience. So what we did was, because I was really a bit of a skeptic when we had the opportunity to, to, to do NASCAR. Because I think that's like, what are you going to do? Like, what, but it turns out as we really dug in, A, the fan base is incredible. They're just like rabid and passionate about it. So it was a perfect, a perfect fan base to say, look, how do we get you closer to the race? How do you become the personal pit crew? And then you know, we, and we backed into what are the decisions that, again, we talked a little bit about last night, but you know, our ethos is we always put fans in a position to be successful. So the idea is you give them um, all good choices, but there are clearly better ones. And so how does that work during the course of a race and what are the needs? And so uh, the pit crew would be a talking to the driver and listening to the crew chief. So we, we, we tapped into the, the, uh, the, the team audio. So fans in real time could hear all of the things that were happening in the car, what he needs. Our driver was talking directly to fans and saying things like, look, we need a pit in the next, you know, I, or the, he, he kept saying that the, the, the car feels a little stiff. Well, you know, here are the fans, I need you to make a choice. And then the crew chief listed four or five different things that we could do to the car to like loosen it up. So it felt a little bit better. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it was, I think, I think we were very successful in having fan, that ex fan experience. They felt like they were making meaningful decisions and it's not, not every play like you do in football, but you know, there was, I don't know, over the course of an hour and a half, it was probably you know, 20, 30 things that they could do, you know, choose high line and low line coming out of the cautions and all of these things that they're not, they're not obviously driving the car, but they are dictating strategy. And it was, it was a neat experience. Yeah, it seems like uh, you, you mentioned that you were a little skeptic uh, about NASCAR. And after the discussion that we had yesterday, true I feel like <laughs> exactly you are a true believer that, sure. you know, out of all the sports that you cover on the platform, yeah. it seems like uh, NASCAR is something that you believe in the most. It was such a surprise. Well, I just, I don't know about the most, but like it, I went from like, you know, uh, it's nothing I like, I, th this sounds denigrating. I don't mean it to be, but my previous space I was in was that it was like, yo, that's a bunch of dudes taking left turns for a living. That's not my idea of a sport. Right. Like, and I didn't like, to be fair, like a lot of things in life, just like the cold plunge this morning, I didn't give it a chance. I didn't, I've written it off. You know, I like, you know, I was like, I, I know things that are for me and that's just not for me and I'll stay with more traditional sports. But as you start digging in, I think it was exciting. I just think there's a like unparalleled level of passion there. Those fans are incredible. You come at it. I mean, the super into it. Uh, I think the drivers are fun to work with that. They're just cut from the same cloth. They're like really interesting characters. Um, and, and there are meaningful touch points. And so, when we st when what unlocked it for me was when we came up with what we said was how do you make you know like how do we make fans feel like part of the pit crew and then that works right that feels like okay i am controlling i am contributing to that strategic layer of you know of the, the the race and so yeah i think i don't know that i'm most passionate about it but i'm so surprised because we talk about you know things that are on our radar obviously we're looking at fan control obviously racing and hoops and football um the the one that uh I'm actually kind of came into it from a different vector. The thing that I'm most excited about now probably is baseball. Are you, if I asked you this, I don't know. Are you a baseball fan? Do you like? I'm not a huge baseball fan. I love baseball when you get to go to a game, right? You have a hot dog, you have a beer, you're hanging out with your friend, and it has literally nothing to do with what's happening on the field. Like going to Dodger <laughs> Stadium is awesome. So I know, I mean, it, I mean, Yeah, I mean. it's great, right? Uh, but it's just a good day out in Los Angeles. That's not because of the sport. And so, for me, that's that challenge. Be like, look, if I can fuck up baseball to the point that guys like you and I want to watch it, that we're in it, then, then, then I think we're really onto something. So, uh, so I think it's been fun, man. Like every one of these sports has got all these different intricacies and you know idiosyncrasies and nuances and all these things. And so it's been fun digging in and learning more about them and understanding those fan bases. And it's been just a wild ride. Yeah, you got a huge opportunity yeah. in, in baseball to like. Right. Make it make it exciting uh, and interesting to actually pay attention to what's happening. There. I mean, imagine if you were calling the pitches. Yeah. I mean, like there, there's so much you can do. I won't, I won't talk about our, our baseball product here, but like we've got a really good working model about how baseball can completely be completely just revamped, just modernized, reinvented for the digital age is what I say. So, yeah. Can't wait. So you are the challenger for the established leagues that are out there. But sure. do you do you feel that, you know, if you could make a bet, yeah. what will be the first sport where the fan control approach will overtake? 
the traditional one. Oh, that's really interesting. Just looking fast forward, you know, yeah. it will happen in some sports sooner or later. Yeah, you know, I think about it like, I, you know, it's interesting. I, like overtake is, is an interesting word. We, we've always felt like we're in parallel. Like I, our goal, and I firmly believe the future of sports is fan control, but our goal would be that, you know, as, as kids growing up now, they'll ask about, they're just two different types of sports. There's traditional sports and FC sports, fan controlled sports. So like, oh, is that just football or is that fan controlled football? Like, like you have an option to be this lean forward, engaged participant in it, I'm leveling up versus that lean back, experience yeah. you know but i feel like you are able to somehow compare where the sports are and it could be like you know by money that yeah. is being processed through the sport sure. or the amount of fans the amount of uh, viewership that yeah. you get and i believe that uh, at uh, some point the fan control approach yeah will just break the barrier and overtake one of the traditional sports I, yeah, I think so too. I think like, I think uh, it's it's just such a compelling loop. Like when you're like you're you're, and I think too. I think like you know you, you play the tapes forward a little bit. I think there will be a time when you know when there's free agency and the players go to different teams. I think there will be this this like m the most subset of the most valuable fans. And people will be recruiting fans to come be part of their team. I and mean, we even saw it a little bit in season two, but this idea that like that guy's a super fan, he's like all, all at the top of the league, he needs to be our guy. And then the, the, the people are recruiting him to be him or to, to be part of what they're doing. So I think I, we, we saw a little and bit. And they, they switched teams? Uh, or or during the course of uh, between seasons, uh -huh. this this like hey look I you know I, I don't know that I want to be aligned with this team anymore. I'm letting you guys know in the Discord. And then there was this like amazing like recruiting, you know, uh, we had a, we had one team change ownership and a bunch of people were like, look, I, you know, that's not, I, I signed up to be a part of this ownership. There's, there's a new ownership. And, and so they kind of announced their free agency and that all of the teams were competing to get these super fans. The guys that were at top of the, the, top of the leaderboard. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was that, great. It was incredible. That's such an interesting dynamic. Right. Yeah, I think, and I think that, that to me seems like an inevitability on sports and bank control sports. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. When when we were chatting last time, it was the boom of Web3. It was it like was. Uh, a crazy was. era of yeah. NFTs. It and was. I wanted to bring us back a little bit. Yeah. We are talking on a day when Bitcoin is uh, booming again, sure right? Is. So we might we're be really onto yeah. something here. But uh, what we have seen in the past 12 months... Uh, was a little bit of a downturn, or at least that. like a little colder period. You didn't say that. Uh, but um, you have made a bet on uh, the Web3 yep. approach uh, early on. Yep. And uh, what is your current assessment of uh, the situation that we are facing? I think it is inevitability, right? Like digital ownership and you know uh, is, is the future of the internet. I genuinely believe Web3 is. I think what happened was it was just a lot of bad actors in the space. Like I, and I think fundamentally uh, people wanted to believe so much in all of these projects. Like there was this, uh, the, the emperor's new clothes kind of thing. It's like, look, no, this is going to be, this is the new hotness. So obviously there was a lot, but I just didn't feel like there was a lot of bad actors that like I soured a lot of people on, on, on the space. Um, you know, I still think um, we're, we're still very excited about digital collectibles kind of going forward. I still think, and we'll talk about it in the future, but this idea of, tokenizing an entire league, right? And having that be, uh, be the driving force, not only in, in the, our own and operated leagues, but uh, a, a protocol that can be leveraged by other, other leagues as well. So um, still, we're still, you know, we're still believing in it. We're, uh, we're still going to, especially as we've got a thriving, uh, I don't know if anybody's thriving from a community perspective, but an awesome Web3 community is part of what we were doing, right? Those just, we had four of our eight teams, for people who don't know, uh, we started season one with four teams, traditional fan controlled teams, you know, like Marshawn Lynch, Richard Sherman, Quavo, all, all these owners had come in. And then as we looked to expand, we really made a big bet, to your point, on Web3, right? We doubled the number of teams and those four new teams were all gated by NFTs, right? And so, I mean, I know you know this, but the the it was, it was a fundamentally different fan experience. It was like that public golf course versus a private golf course, right? Like you buy the NFT and then you're part of a more exclusive, you know, cohort of play callers and, and super fans. And so obviously smaller audiences, your vote carries more weight because there's just 
by definition, there's fewer of you and it's capped, right? We sold, we sold out that. Anyway, uh, the, I think we still want to continue to do right by that community. And we've got a lot of things coming for those folks that did purchase NFTs, both, both digital benefits, but also really cool IRL experiences. We did a lot of that in season two where, you know, uh, uh, we, our, our project is called the Ballers. Uh, so Ballers holder would be able to like lead the team on the field or or play catch with a quarterback, right? Look up before the game. So we've got all, a lot in store for these and we're going to be announcing over the next couple of months about what, what what the future of that stuff is. But I think, you know, we're still bullish on it for sure. Are you? How are you feeling about it? I, I'm i very bullish. I just, uh, you know, uh, can't really predict how much time it will take. Yeah. I still believe in the power of blockchain i mean same. i think that uh we put too much emphasis uh in the past on the terms themselves and the oh, technology sure. behind it for sure do you know what we, we spoke last night a little bit about that you, you mentioned our inability to predict the future because we are living in wild unprecedented times it's moving it's, it's moving so fast like the pace of uh you know, development of things is insane. insane. And I have no clue what's going to be happening in the next five years. And like, I think I can make a uh, few bets for sure. next year. And yeah. I, I, I did so. And I named three things that I think are going to happen next year. Okay. For me, number one, we will see the continuation of the AI boom with, uh, new models, new applications. I think that everybody is now tapping into figuring out the best use case because sure. uh, the power of a AI is there and we should start using it more and we should learn how to embed it into our lives. So this yeah, is yeah. one whole category. The second one, obviously, and we touched it uh, last night uh, also, is that I think that there might be a breakthrough in finally having a virtual reality device yeah. that will kick off uh, some bigger adoption, right? It's so. like, it's not going to be right away the device that everyone gets, yeah. but this, it was the same for the first iPhone, right? Did you have the first iPhone? No, I was a hardcore BlackBerry. I had a BlackBerry Bold, and I absolutely refused to get that toy of a phone. And I think I jumped on. I think I jumped on in the like the three with the introduction of the App Store. I think is when yeah, I, when I, I, when I jumped adopted. on with three GS. So yeah, it yeah. was the third generation. Yeah, and it. so what I'm saying is that like I think that there will be a breakthrough in the virtual reality and augmented reality space. Yeah, and it's not that. Like everybody is getting a VR headset next year, sure, sure. but um, I think the form factor, the cost of the device, the the weight of the device, it will be getting smaller and smaller. Hopefully, more embedded into yeah. you know something that we can wear. Uh, and there'll be this killer app associated with it, right? Like I like I think that's that the chicken and egg. And so for me, that's the the second bucket, yeah. and the third. Um, and I think that like I, I mentioned it earlier, like we see. Uh, uh, a boom of Bitcoin. Yeah. There is, uh, there might be an ETF uh, yeah. uh, associated with Bitcoin yeah. uh, being approved and launched yeah. uh, quite soon. And I would love to see some real blockchain and cryptocurrency use cases yeah. that are going to be happening on a major scale. Because right. up until sure. now, yes. up until now, it was a lot about speculation uh, and the finance side of things. 100%. And I would love to see people more uh, transacting on blockchain, right? Yes. Uh, I would like to get retail on board and uh, uh, make sure that we can lever we can fully leverage the, the power of blockchain as we should with like authenticity and uh, that's all answer. of those kind of things. Honestly, that's what really excites me about blockchain right now is authenticity, right? Like the, we are living in a world where Defakes will be indistinguishable, right? Like it's wild. I heard the other day that there, there are, there's a group out there that is able to build an entire voice model from you from your voicemail. They need five seconds of your voice and then they can model. And so they said, I mean, that's their claim. But like, imagine that. Like literally, kids growing up now won't, knowing what's real will be impossible. I think that's where blockchain, I sleep, I sleep better at night knowing that there is a, that immutable ledger and that you'll be able to prove authenticity because of the blockchain. Yeah, and I think that 
these two things they need to happen at the same time yeah. because if you are able to fake voice yep. if you are able to fake video or uh, then you are able to fake anything okay. basically and like how do you ensure that something is real Right. And right. we will need that so bad. So I mean, I, I'm glad that exists. Yeah, these are these are my uh, three little predictions sure. for next year. Beyond that, it's empty. I have I have no clue. Yeah. I love that you led with the AR VR. Are you are you an enthusiast? Do you love that device? Do you have a device? Are you passionate about it? I'd love to know what applications you've been messing around with. You playing any games? I am the kind of person that wants to try everything. Yeah, okay. Early, newest, latest, best. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I have bought, like, majority of the new VR okay. headsets okay. when they came out. Sure, yeah. The problem is that, like, do I use them now? Yeah. No. I'm right? Confused. Unfortunately, what I do is I put them on the shelf. Yeah. I, well, you're not alone, right? Like they have, they have the so data. I, on that. I, I try to, like, you know, I try all the features. I try to make a, like a virtual phone call. I do like a virtual meeting. Yeah. I play some games, sure. uh, and then I'm like, okay, yeah. good, I'm done with it. Boom, yeah. goodbye. Yeah, I did and, I yeah. and, and, and I hope that this is gonna break. Yeah, I do too. This, uh, you know, what gave me hope this year was did you did you get the PlayStation uh, the VR two their second headset? I haven't tried. Honestly, it's actually, it's incredible, right? Like the quality of screens, it is, it's a bummer that it's locked to that ecosystem because it is an incredible device. It genuinely has me so excited about the future of VR. And it's, it's like custom tailored for the PlayStation ecosystem so they can do things that, um, you know, other headsets can't. But uh, there is a, they're a killer application for me. It took up so much of my time this year. Obviously, you know, you and I talked a little bit about this. I'm the, I'm a big gamer. I'm a core gamer. I try and game a little bit every night. We talked during our, our workout about our routine. I try and get in 30, 40 minutes a night, kind of decompress before I go to sleep. What took up a month's worth of my time, that 45 minutes an hour every night, was uh, Gran Turismo on the headset. It is the experience of... The, and all of the cockpit stuff is is pretty fun anyway, after you've played any of the games where you're like in a thing. But Gran Turismo, you've got these beautifully modeled authentic like replicas of these cars. So I, immediately I went and unlocked some cars that I had owned just to compare them. I drove the Tesla as well in there. Uh, went and bought a, a BMW. Um, but you, what's so interesting about racing games, I never were interesting to me. Like, you know, I, I can understand how like they're technological marvels, but they're not fun for me to play. This positions you in the car and that is the only view. You know, historically when you play a, a race game, you're like, the camera's way high. And you even, you try to get back as far as you can so you can see the curb. And so, well, being being in the car with the headset, it allows you to drive forward, but then look around to the curve. So you start predicting as you drive, and it was just a transformative. I think like it, one of my favorite, one of my favorite games uh, ever in VR, and I just like it has me really excited about what's to come because like they felt to the point where you the sense of speed. I talked about this all day, but the sense of speed in in VR sometimes you lose. But you felt you felt like bracing for it when you go into a turn really hard. It's incredible. Highly recommend. Are there any trends uh, outside of what I have uh, mentioned that you see uh, popping out uh, in the next year? Trends and trends in what se- in, in what sense? Just like what what we should- what we will see happening in the tech space. I think uh, I think you hit the head on on. AI, I think that everybody's looking at how to incorporate that and what the um, what the next thing. Um, I also would agree, not to crib all your answers, but I think that's right. I, and maybe this is just me hoping that it's the case, but I think we have a both a hardware and a software breakthrough in the in the in the virtual reality space. Um, I don't know, man. The future's crazy. It's crazy. I like I I don't why I don't I feel like I can't place a bet on anything because I just I'm you know we're. I mean, we talk about adoption, fan adoption of sports and whatnot, but like as far as like just overarching technology, I think like the world looks diametrically different today than it did this time a year ago. I mean, it's just, it's wild. So no, no doubt. Buckling up. Yeah. Buckling up. If you could mention two to three things that you would like the audience to take away from our conversation, what would it be? Uh, that cold plunges will change your life. If you have not tried, jump in, jump in a bucket of cold water. It is a total game changer. Uh, I would say, um, that, well, I'll repeat what Dave Edmondson said, that strategy is what you say no to. 
Thank you so much for listening or watching to the very end. I hope that can only mean one thing, that you really enjoyed it. And if you did, please go ahead and follow us, subscribe or write a review and it will be tremendously appreciated by our side. In the meantime, there are a bunch of other episodes that you can check out. And I'll be looking forward to catching you next time.